All right, I think we're going to get started here just a couple minutes early. If you'd stand with us, we're going to start our opening song, I Will Call Upon the Lord. Here we go. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be. So shall I be praised by my enemy. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Why don't you go ahead, take a moment, greet some neighbors. Come on back. We're going to sing that through one more time here. Here we go. I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be so saved. So shall I enemy. be praised by my enemy. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and the God of my salvation. The Lord live and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Amen. Got some energy this morning. You may be seated. All right, well, welcome to Blanchard Community Church. Welcome to September. That's what month it is. Uh, do we have uh, September birthdays? Show of hands. I don't see any September birthdays. Oh, we got, there we go. We got a, we got a few. Let's, let's sing happy birthday, John. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. A September anniversary. We've got, one, we've got a couple. Wonderful. I see some long ones, and um, we're going to go ahead. We, we've got we've got a long um, bit of things here, so let's just go ahead and sing "Happy Anniversary." Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. We do have some announcements there. I believe they're also in the bulletin if you'd look to that for those. I um, wanted to remember this weekend as tomorrow's Labor Day, uh, we as believers, um, you know, we, we labor as unto the Lord. Um, one of, there's a couple verses I was looking at this morning from Colossians just ones that we think of whatever we do work heartily as for the lord not for men first corinthians so whether we eat or drink or whatever we do do all to the glory of god um i i've heard a pastor say it once and i've looked it up and it seems to be the case uh there's there's two words that traditional biblical hebrew hebrew doesn't actually have a word for and that's retirement which doesn't mean we're supposed to work at one thing forever, but we're always called to be doing, laboring for the Lord. And there's different seasons in life, and we go where God calls us in that season, but we're, to, we're never to just end. That's when we die. That's when he calls us home. If, if we have no more uses, he calls us home. Um, as well as coincidence, and it's no coincidence that God called you to this season in life, and so we just look to him for, for our direction in that. Um, we have a quick video. We had issues on the 4th for our Independence Day video, um, computer issues. So this is just a short video from 
a different time when we had uh, a, an inspirational person that knew how to speak in the White House. So if we can go ahead and play that. Yeah, oh yes, that's right. We do have, uh, I'll go ahead and have you give that uh, announcement. Yes, Um, and then also, I guess we're just giving a heads up. We're going to have a board. The board meeting is going to be the 20th this month at 530. Uh, we had to move it for a scheduling conflict. So, But if you go ahead and watch this video. So I know we're not getting that kind of talks from uh, pulpit mics and, and things like that from our leadership today. But as, as God's people, you know, much of our country doesn't relate to what we just saw there. But we are still called to bring to them the truth, you know, so that people ask us, you know, what's this hope you have in us? And I think the better that we represent that um, and, and think about that. I, I was just relating to things this weekend that Labor Day isn't just about your, your paid nine to five job, um, but it's, it's how we labor in each place we're called to. So I appreciated that. And that actually gave me hope looking at that, not despair that, a man from my childhood that was our president is not <laughs> likely to be the caliber of people we're, we're getting these days. So, But anyway, um, if we could get on to prayer and praise, Steve, I think we're ready for that. Good morning, everybody. Good to be here today. Glad everybody's here today. Uh, take some prayer requests if you'd like to give us some? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So. Dear Father in heaven, and once again we come before you as a believers united in prayer. We know that uh, where we come together and pray that uh, it moves the hand of God and we are, are uh, forever grateful for that and just for the love that you have shown us and the care that you give to each one of us. And we want to think about these particular requests this morning uh, the Goodrow family with the passing of Richard that uh, that you can just provide comfort and uh, uh, witness to them in this time of uh, distress and just watch over them and uh, we also want to think of Joe Workel and he can recover rapidly from his surgery we just pray your healing and blessing on uh, him and Janice um, with Vance we just uh, uh, just pray for him once again and we just thank you for him and his family and just uh, uh, just pray a blessing on him as he continues on in his life we just thank you for uh, that and for uh, Matt uh, with the job just looking for that and the work and just that you'll provide for him and just draw him closer to you as well and with Jim and Peggy as they travel just watch over them and others and that may be in our uh, group here that are traveling just give them mercies and safety um, for Roland and, and his wife we don't know exactly what all is going on there but you know and, and you know their heart and their situation just provide the needs that they have and uh, just a sense of your closeness to them as well uh, we want to think about the kids that are going back to school a lot of them this next week just pray a special protection and blessing on them and uh, just watch over each one as as they go back to school now in, in person uh, pray for Jeff and Terry and just uh, we do thank you for them and their presence here in our lives and our fellowship and just watch over them and just provide health and strength uh, for them both as well uh, we want to continue to pray for this family member of uh, Eric that uh, dealing with depression that that can be alleviated and, and can be dealt with we just thank you for that um, with Dave we pray for his brother Herb and, and uh, uh, his heart condition and other health issues just pray that again that the doctors will have wisdom there and that you can provide a healing uh, for him as well and uh, with Eileen we just uh, uh, thank you for her and, and her ministry and just her uh, friendship here in our church body and uh, just uh, uh, praise you for each one that's here this morning we just pray your health and safety for each of us 
uh, and uh, that as it's uh, been mentioned that as we look at Labor Day that we'll realize that we're on your payroll and that uh, we work for you and, and it's a, just a blessed thing to, uh, to be working in accordance with God's purposes. We just thank you for this as we look forward to uh, this weekend and the weeks to come. We thank you for this service and each one that's involved. We can be a blessing to you as we uh, praise you in song and in uh, looking at your word. We thank you for each of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We may not know what tomorrow holds for us, but we know who holds tomorrow. So if you'd stand with us, we're going to continue our worship. when we're ready. <clears throat> practice that went really well we had timing down I don't know what happened but we give that to God so because it's well with my soul it is well
sang this one recently, but uh, I think I grew up singing it, so I should be pretty familiar. i 
is a new one we've been working on this month. Uh, Jesus, thank you. Uh, some good truth in here. So if uh, if we're not following along or if we're not having the, the same luck we had at practice, go ahead and, and speak these words to God um, as you read the lyrics. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, cross your son. Drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away. truth in that one all right if you'd stand with us for this last one we're going to need some energy give thanks to the lord our god and king his love endures forever for he is good he is above all things his love endures forever Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that has been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise.
yours forever And by the grace of God We will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever and ever. be seated. Good morning. Scripture reading today, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain And when he was set, the disciples came upon him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manners of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Thank you. Uh, It's interesting watching the video that they showed this morning that they had planned for July 4th, and President Reagan talked about peace. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. In fact, um, just looking on the Internet... Um, on what a definition for peace is. And it was interesting, uh, one of the major websites said, the definition for peace is the absence of war. The absence of war. Now, some of you might be old enough to remember when there was such a thing. But I'll prove you wrong. Okay? Okay. One source said that there has been only 26 days of peace since 1945. But this does not include guerrilla warfare, civil wars, or insurgents. So, who knows? Another source claimed that in the last 3,500 years, since they've been keeping records, historical records, There has been 8,000 treaties made and broken. In the 3,500 years of recorded history, there has only been 286 years of peace. And it's interesting this morning what Christ says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The God of peace has emphasized that making peace is one of the most important ideas in his word. In fact, scripture contains over 400 direct references to peace and many more indirect references. The Bible opens with peace in the Garden of Eden and closes with peace in eternity. I kind of like that. Although the peace on the earth in the garden was interrupted when man sinned, at the cross, Jesus Christ made peace a reality again. 
and he becomes peace to all people because he is the God of peace. In fact, Christ is going to one day come, the Prince of Peace is what he's called, and establish a worldwide peace which will eventuate in ultimate peace in the new heaven and the new earth. Amen. Um, everybody has looked for governments to br constantly bring peace, but the only government that will bring peace, and it'll last for a thousand years, is the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the most obvious facts of human history is that peace does not characterize man's earthly existence. There is no peace now for two reasons. First, the opposition of Satan and the disobedience of man. In fact, Satan and his sinful man Satan and sinful mankind are engaged right now with the God of peace in a battle for sovereignty, if you haven't noticed that. With all the well-intentioned efforts for peace in modern times, and you just heard since um, they started recording history, uh, 8,000 treaties made, 8,000 treaties broken. Nor does the world honor peace by much of its standards and actions as it does by its words. In almost every age of history, the greatest heroes have been the greatest warriors. The model man is not meek, but macho. The model hero is not self-giving, but self-seeking. Not generous, but selfish. Not gentle, but oftentimes cruel. Not submissive, but aggressive, and not meek, but proud and arrogant. The peace of which Christ speaks in this beatitude and about which the rest of Scripture speaks is unlike that which the world knows and strives for. God's peace has nothing to do with arbitration, compromise, negotiated truces, or treaties. In fact, one theologian put it this way, and I really like uh, how he put this. He said, God's peace, the peace of which the Bible speaks, never, never evades the issues. It knows nothing of peace at any price. It does not gloss over or hide or rationalize or excuse. It confronts the problems and seeks to solve them. And after the problems are solved... It builds a bridge between those two parties who are separated by the problems. It often brings its own struggle, pain, hardship, and anguish because such are often the price of healing. It is not peace that will be brought by kings, presidents, prime ministers, diplomats, or international humanitarians. It is the inner personal peace that only God can give to the soul of man that only his children can exemplify. I think that pretty much explains and defines what it's talking about here when he says, blessed are the peacemakers. The essential fact to comprehend is that peace about which Jesus is speaking here is more of not the absence of conflict and strife, it is the presence of righteousness. Only righteousness can produce the relationship that brings the two parties together. Men can stop fighting without righteousness, but they cannot live peaceably without righteousness. The most man's peace can offer is really a truce, which is the temporary sensation of hostilities. God's peace, however, not only stops the hostilities, but settles the issues and brings the parties together in mutual love and harmony. One of the things that when I was preaching through the book of Philippians that I became very well aware of is that it talks about unity. With one heart we need to have, one purpose and believe me, a church that does not work on that will never have unity in its midst. 
James confirms the nature of God's peace when he writes, he says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. Interesting, we preached on that last week. Then peaceable. God's way to peace is through purity. Peace cannot be attained at the expense of righteousness. Two people cannot be at peace until they recognize and resolve the wrong attitudes and actions that cause the conflict between them. The pure in heart are always working towards God's peace. The writer of Hebrews instructs believers to pursue peace with all men. Peace cannot be disconnected from holiness. In fact, biblically speaking, where there is true peace, there is righteousness, holiness, and purity. Jesus saying, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword seems to be in the opposite or in conflict with the seventh beatitude. His meaning, however, was that peace that he came to bring is not peace at any price. To be peacemakers on God's terms requires peacemakers on the terms of truth and righteousness to which the world is in fierce opposition to. And you especially see it in the day and age we are living in. When believers set God's standards of righteousness before the world that seems to love wickedness, there is an inevitable potential for strife and conflict. It's interesting. Christians are to be peacemakers, and most Christians are peacemakers. And yet the world seems to hate peacemakers. Until righteousness or unrighteousness is changed to righteousness, there cannot be godly peace. At the process, or in the process of revolution, or this resolution to bring peace, you're going to find it's very difficult and costly. A person who does not first mourn over his own sin will never be satisfied with God's righteousness or God's peace. The sword that Christ brings is the sword of his word, which is the sword of truth and righteousness. The great enemy of peace, of course, is sin. Sin separates men from God and causes disharmony and enmity with him. And man's lack of harmony with God causes their lack of harmony or harmony with each other. The world is filled with strife and war because it is filled with sin. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is more deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Wicked hearts cannot produce a peaceful society. In fact, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord in Isaiah 48, 22. To talk of peace without first talking of repentance for sin is really to talk foolishly and vainly. Until a person confronts his own sin, it makes no sense to offer him a savior. Until a person acknowledges his enmity with God, it makes no sense to offer him Peace with God. Those who in the name of love or kindness or compassion who try to witness by appeasement and compromise of God's word will find that their witness leads people not towards Christ but away. God's peace comes only in God's way. Being a peacemaker is essentially the result of a holy life and the call to others to embrace the gospel of holiness. Men are without peace because they are without God, who is the source of peace. Both the Old and New Testaments are loaded with statements of God's being the God of peace. Christ coming to the earth was the peace of God coming to the earth because only Jesus Christ could remove sin which is the great barrier to peace. In fact, it says this in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly off 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Christ brings back together God and man, reconciling and bringing peace. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, it talks about in Colossians 1. At the cross, all of man's hatred and anger was vented against God. The Son of God was mocked, cursed, spit on, pierced, reviled, and killed. When Christ died, the earth shook violently, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Yet through that violence, God brought peace. God's greatest righteousness confronted man's greatest wickedness, and righteousness won. And because righteousness won, peace was now made available for all mankind. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, will establish his kingdom of peace for a thousand years on earth and for all eternity in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. Boy, if you didn't have that highlighted and underlined in your Bible, what's stopping you? The one who does not belong to God through Jesus Christ can neither have peace nor be a peacemaker. The messengers of peace are believers. Only those who belong to the maker of peace can be messengers of peace. The ministry of reconciliation is the ministry of peacemaking. In fact, it says this in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. Have you ever thought about why did God choose us to share the gospel with others? Why he chose us to be ambassadors for him? He could have really done it without us. And yet he chose us to bring the gospel to others. There are at least four, char four things that characterize a peacemaker. Boy, I had to really think through these. First, he is the one himself who has made peace with God. The gospel is all about peace, and when we receive Christ as our Savior, he has imputed his righteousness to us. Our battle with God ended, and our peace with God began. Because he has made peace with God, he can enjoy the peace of God. And because he has been given God's peace, he's called to share God's peace. He is to have his very feet, and it says this in Ephesians 6, he's to have his very feet shod with the gospel of peace. Because sin breaks our fellowship with God, a peacemaker must be constantly walking with the Holy Spirit. Second, a peacemaker needs to lead others to make peace with God. They are the body of sinners cleansed by Jesus Christ and commissioned to carry out his gospel of cleansing to the rest of the world, one person said. You know, the Pharisees were the embodiment of what peacemakers are not. They were smug, proud, complacent, self-righteous, and determined to have their own ways and defend their own rights. They had scant interest in making peace with Rome, 
with the Samaritans or even with fellow Jews who did not follow their own party line. Consequently, they created strife wherever they went. They cooperated with others only when it was to their own advantage as they did with the Sadducees, which is interesting if you studied the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were in opposition against each other, and yet they came together to oppose Jesus Christ. The peacemaking spirit is the opposite of that. It is built on humility, sorrow over sin, gentleness, a hunger for righteousness, mercy, and purity of heart. Third, a peacemaker helps others to make peace with others. The moment a person comes to Christ, he comes, becomes at peace with God and with the church and becomes himself a peacemaker in the world. A peacemaker builds bridges between men and God and also between men and other men. In fact, for a couple of years, I had that ministry of going around to churches and playing the part of a peacemaker. At first, I kind of enjoyed it as I saw people reconciled and would ask forgiveness of each other and forgive one another and become one again. As I continued on in that ministry, I got to a point where I didn't enjoy it anymore because Christians or so-called Christians did not want to be peacemakers. Paul says, so far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. We are even to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. In any relationship, our first responsibility is to see that our own side of the bridge has a solid base. That means we need to evaluate our lives every now and then. But we also have the responsibility to help the one on the other side of the bridge to build his base. Both sides of a bridge must be built on righteousness and truth or the bridge will not stand. The process sometimes involving having to confront others about their sin, which is the supreme barrier to peace. Sin that is not dealt with is a sin that will disrupt and destroy peace. If we are unwilling to help others confront their sin, we will be unable to help them find peace. And the fourth thing, a peacemaker endeavors to find a point of agreement. God's truth and righteousness must never be compromised or weakened. God's people are to contend without being contentious, to disagree without being disagreeable, and to confront without being abusive or attacking. The peacemaker speaks the truth in love, it says, as it says in Ephesians 4, 15. To start with love is to start towards peace. When we begin peacemaking by starting with whatever peaceful point of agreement we can find, the peacemaker always gives others the benefit of the doubt, or at least they should. He never assumes that they will resist the gospel or reject his testimony. In fact, I got a story about this. Uh, we had a class um, called Personal Evangelism. And... Uh, in that class, we were to uh, memorize the four spiritual laws, okay? Has everybody heard of the four spiritual laws? Boy, maybe I should ask Hans who never heard it. Anyway, it was a gospel presentation. Um, Kennedy was the name of the guy, I forget his first name, that came up with these things. And so we memorized those things. And then what our professor did is he had picked four places to go and witness to. And this was in Spokane. And so the first place he picked, and he said, I'm going to pick the easiest place for you to witness and share the gospel with someone, and then we'll work slowly to the hardest place. So the first place he sent us to 
was Dick's Burger Emporium. You know where that is in Spokane? Okay. If you've never eaten at Dick's, you're missing a good, well, no. Anyway, that was the first place we sent us to. Why? Because they get a lot of people down there that are from the streets, and those people are more willing to listen to the gospel. And so that's the first place he sent us. Although it was interesting, when we were down there, there was about 10 policemen at it. <laughs> and so we got to share the gospel with some of those. Then the next place he sent us to was Gonzaga. Sent us on campus there. And I was amazed at how many people from different faiths there were there. And uh, we had, there was about, uh, what was there, about 35, 35 of us in the class. And he sent us out in pairs. And so then the prof went with one person all the time. And so no one had accepted Christ at either one of those places. And I forget the third place he sent us. But the last place he sent us was Spokane Falls Community College. And we went out there, and he said that was going to be the hardest. And I don't know why he picked that as the hardest. In fact, I never asked him why he picked the, uh, that one being the hardest. But he sent us out there, and the guy I was with, this good friend of mine, Robert McDowell, and one of us was supposed to be sharing the gospel with a person while the other one was praying and supporting it. And so we got out there, and I went first, and I shared the gospel with someone where Robert was praying. And then Robert, we were sitting there, and you kind of had to watch which person you were going to pick. And then Robert went out and picked up this one person and uh, this one guy, and he went through the gospel presentation. And then at the end of the gospel presentation, you're supposed to ask the person, are you willing to accept Christ as your personal Savior? Well, Robert went through the spiel and did it. And he said, are you willing to accept Christ as your personal Savior? And the guy goes, yes. I was shocked. Robert was shocked. <laughs> really? And so Robert went through the spill again. He went through the big, long talk with the guy. And he goes, now you have to admit you're a sinner. You need to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Are you willing to do that? And the guy goes, yes. <laughs> and I didn't reach out and grab Robert because I was just as shocked as Robert and so we sit there and prayed with that guy and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we tried to uh, get him to go to one of the evangelical churches in Spokane. God has chosen us to be the peacemakers and speak the truth in love. When a peacemaker meets opposition, he tries to be patient or should be patient with the other people's blindness and stubbornness. Why? Because he knows that the Lord was patient with him through his blindness and stubbornness as well. I don't know if you remember when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I do. And for 22 years of my life, you know, even though I was raised in a good Christian family by good Christian parents, and my dad had the rule, as long as you sit up at the table and you eat my food, you're going to Sunday school and church. I just went through the motions, and then when I graduated from high school, got out on my own, I did my own thing. I remember when I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. Yes, God took me through a tragic car accident, and I should have been killed. Wasn't wearing a seatbelt, going over 80 miles an hour. Was uh, doing some drugs. And um, turned around. This will date me. Uh, we had eight-track tape players. I know. So I reached around to get a new, new eight-track, and I turned the wheel when I turned that. She went off into the rivers by the Columbia River, went along 80 miles an hour, but it's going so fast I didn't drop in the river. And then a tree kicked me up back towards the road again. I hit a rock and I T-boned three times. And then the car was going around, 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 and I was sitting on a dome light. I walked out of the car, and first thing I did was throw the stuff in the river so I wouldn't get caught. And then I walked down to a friend's place. And when I was walking down to the friend's place, 
which was about a mile and a half away, I heard God say in my heart, I could have taken your life tonight and you would have spent eternity in a Christless eternity. I was stubborn and I waited for about six more weeks and then my dad was working out in the field. I was a contractor then. And I went to my mom and I said, how do I accept Christ as my Savior? And so she led me through the spiel. And that's when I accepted Christ. We need to remember how patient God was towards us. The merit or result of peacemaking is eternal blessings as God's children in God's kingdom. He says, the peacemakers shall be called sons of God. Now, girls, don't take this personally. He uses sons. Why does he use the word sons here? Because we are associated with the Son of God. You know, nothing compares to being like a child of God. Does it? I don't think so. You know, the words both sons and children are used in the New Testament to speak of believers' relationship to God. Child is a term of, of tender affection and endearment as well as relationship. Sons, however, expresses the dignity and honor of the relationship of the child to his parents. As God's peacemakers, we are promised the glorious blessings of eternal sonship in his eternal kingdom. God has determined that his spirit-led peacemakers are to be humble, repentant over their sin, gentle, the seekers of righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, and should strive to be the peacemakers. God's peacemakers will not always have peace in the world. As Jesus makes clear by the next beatitude we're going to look at, persecution usually follows peacemaking. In Christ, we have forsaken the false peace of this world, and consequently, we often will not have peace in the world. In fact, a pastor friend of mine, he uh, went to a church. He was pastoring a church in Northern California, and then he went to this church in Indiana. And it was a pretty large church, and he felt, you know, he was kind of moving up the ranks, so to speak, as a pastor. He was a pastor in a church of about 100, and then he went to this rather large church. And um, he went through the uh, candidate process, and then they called him to be a pastor, and this church had been having a feud in it for, boy, I forget how many years he said, but it had been going on and on and on, this feud. The one people said on one side of the church, the other people said on the other side of the church. And they went through pastor after pastor, but one thing that they did that they came into unity over was to get rid of the following pastor they had and get another one. And you know what they are fighting over? Music. Whether they do praise songs or hymns. That's why we at this church have chosen to be balanced. Because we have people on both sides. We often fight over the stupidest things, don't we? But as God's children, we may always have peace while we are in the world. It is the peace of God which the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much that you have called us to be the peacemakers because, Lord, through acceptance of your Son, through a confession of our sins, we have peace with you. And Lord, we have it for all eternity. Yes, I know, Lord, that when I sin, I lose that fellowship with you. 
But Lord, I thank you that no matter what goes on in this world, and boy, there's a lot going on in this day and age, that we have the peace that you have brought to us. And Lord, we trust by faith that you will continue to bring peace to an unpeaceable world. And Lord, I thank you that you have called us to be your ambassadors so that we might share the peace that we have with others as they come to you by faith. And all God's people said, Amen. If the men will come forward, we're going to have communion. If you're uh, first time here visiting, we want you to know we have an open communion. In other words, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you're part of the church. And we're back to the old way we used to do it, which is good. Um, but if you um, do not feel comfortable taking uh, the... Uh, Parts of the communion table, uh, we have some of those nice little cups in back with a wafer on top, and uh, I think they're available, aren't they? Don's. <laughs> we were going to have a basket back there, right? Huh? Okay, Lenny's got them, so if you want one of those, just kind of stick your hand up and she'll bring you one of those. Okay. Uh, the ordinance for communion, and it's, it's always amazed me that the ordinance for communion is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you know anything about the church at Corinth, they were anything but peaceful sometimes. But this great ordinance was given to this church. And it's, he's, the Apostle Paul is speaking here, of course, through the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And he says, for I received from the Lord, which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. In remembrance of me. It, it, one thing I was thinking about last night as I was studying this passage, um, as I was thinking about it, is how could denominations in other churches miss it when Christ said, do this in remembrance of me? You know probably some people, some denominations, some churches that use the ordinance of communion as a means for salvation. In fact, one of the churches that I took uh, my teenagers when I was a youth pastor to, to do a mission trip, and we provided, a, we did a vacation Bible school at it, and it was a church that believed that, and why they asked us to come in, I don't know, and do a vacation Bible school, because we preached, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And as I was up there looking at, they had this manual that they, it was a year's worth of uh, sermons that the pastor would get up and regurgitate every Sunday. He would turn to whatever date it was, and they had the sermons written out for him and the prayers and all that stuff. And one thing, when I was looking in the back of the book, it had the ordinance of communion. So I looked at it, and it said, through communion, you're joined with Christ, and that is salvation. Notice what Christ said two times, do this in remembrance of me. We celebrate what Christ did. And it's interesting, we're doing communion when I talked about being a peacemaker and God's peace. It only can happen through your faith in Jesus Christ. And boy, we celebrate, or we should celebrate, when it comes to communion, remembering what Christ has done for us. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, For whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Isn't that cool? I think so. It says, Therefore, whoever eats of the bread or drinks of the cup 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself first before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. How do you partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is if you still have sin in your heart and your life that you have not confessed to the Lord. And you need to definitely evaluate your life to make sure it's not guilt. It says in Hebrews that when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, we are cleansed from a guilty conscience. You'll never go back and be able to live your life over again but one thing you need to be assured in is when you ask God to forgive you of your sins, He has cleansed you from all unrighteousness, Amen. all sin. He goes on to say, For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak, sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. These prerequisites were never written for unbelievers. They're written for believers. And if we're not willing to confess our sin, God is going to discipline us. And if you've ever been to that spiritual woodshed, I don't know about you, I don't like it. And that's why God disciplines us. And I love that in Hebrews 12 where it says, Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. One pastor said one of the assurances that you're one of God's children is that he disciplines you. It says, When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. We always take a little time while Joan plays a, a wonderful song. If you need to do business with the Lord, I would encourage you to do that. If you need to, if you are standing with the Lord, both have that relationship and that fellowship, thank the Lord for what he's done for you. Thank the Lord that he has brought peace and that he has called you to be a peacemaker. Lord, we thank you that we get to celebrate this each and every month, remembering, Lord, what you've done for us. And Lord, we have so much as your children to be thankful for. Lord, I thank you for your care, your guidance, your help, and yes, your mercy that you give to us. And Lord, as we partake of the bread right now, we ask your blessings upon it remembering what you've done for us on the cross. In your name, amen. Let's all take together. Doug, would you ask the blessing on the cup, please? Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. It's with great joy that we do this celebration, but it's also with humility. And we take this cup in your name. Amen. Amen. That after he had given thanks, he took and said, this represents the new covenant we have because of the blood of Christ. Let's all partake together. 
It says in the gospel account of the Last Supper that when they left, they left singing. And so, Jason. All right. If you'd stand with us, we're going to sing our closing song, Victory in Jesus. Benediction today. It's uh, from Paul's word to the church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity the spirit of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So let's remember that as we remember Randy's message to be a peacemaker this week. Have a great week. Thank you.